Hi guys, welcome to my weekly Q&A session, my AMA, Ask Me Anything. I am Graham. Hey, if you don't know me, my name's Graham Jones. I'm British, as you'll tell really quickly. <laughs> um, I grew up in Cheshire in the northwest of the UK. Folks originally from Wales and uh, I lived in France for 20 years and uh, did some missions work there. I now live in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Spell Massachusetts. Mm. And I um, lead a bunch of churches and are involved in just kingdom things here and travel in ministry, so. Good, hey, um, we have five questions today. Before we jump into those, let me just run through a few quick housekeeping pieces as well. Number one, if you're not yet a subscriber to our YouTube channel, we've been working this year on building that. Um, I've seen it grow from about 10 people to about, around about 2,000. So if you hit the subscribe button on YouTube, if you're watching that way, or simply connect through the links below, uh, YouTube will let you know when we send out new videos. Also press the bell symbol if you're on YouTube and they will do that. Um, Hey, secondly, we have a free gift. Free gift. Um, I have a three hour teaching on how to receive healing for yourself that I'd be really happy to give to anybody watching today. Uh, just click on the link below and we will get that into your inbox. Three hours of teaching on receiving healing. Even if you're not sick right now, you know somebody who is, and it's so important that we get truth within us. It's really great teaching that. What I often do when, um, Sometimes, quite often, uh, people will call me and say, hey, will you, will you drive an hour? Will you go to a hospital? Will you come and pray for me? And what I will often do is I will say, hey, I will come and pray. I'll drive an hour there and an hour back and take the time or whatever. But before I come, I want you to listen to this teaching. And what I've discovered is um, if you'll get the word, the truth within them, it's really easy then to lead them into healing. So uh, check that out. That would be a real blessing. I know to you. Hey, a couple of other quick things as well. Uh, I am uh, I have a ministry school, an online ministry training school. It meets here in uh, Massachusetts, in New England, in person, but also you can follow it completely online. So if you want to check that out, go to ministry, ministryschool.net, ministryschool, excuse me, dot net, and uh, you can jump on board that at any time, and we'll be ordaining People. We have an ordination program coming out of that in the summer. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention, I'm going to be starting a support group for those who are on the journey of believing God for healing. I'm going to start an online healing rooms, if you will. I know some of you will be familiar with John G. Lake and his ministry and just taking some inspiration out of Lake. So online healing rooms um, will be starting late next week. And if you're interested in finding out more, if you are sick and you... Sometimes we need a community. There are times it does take a village to support us and help us walk through some of those journeys of faith. Um, it's one thing, sometimes it can get discouraging being on your own. Discouragement is one of the tools Satan uses, uh, the word says in Joshua chapter one. So that can be a real help and a blessing to you. Good. Well, I have five questions today I'm gonna to run through. Um, here are these questions. I have the question, I believe in God for something, but it isn't working. Help. <laughs> it's a good question. It's an honest question. Uh, question number two there, I have the question, a uh, question about communion. And I've seen a lot of this pop up in the last two or three weeks in the body of Christ. What's the right way of taking communion? Should communion be the center of our worship service kind of thing? Um, Thirdly, uh, I have a question about the organized church. Should we belong to an organized church? Hmm. Uh, fourth question, this is one that comes up quite a long. Uh, must Christians tithe? Do we have to tithe? Do we have to give tithes and offerings financially? Um, and then last question, how do we pray for the healing of others? And I mean, there's some more there, but it's basically the idea you know, do we have a right to pray for others? Can we guarantee healing when we pray for others? Good, so let's jump into these questions. Uh, so question number one, somebody says, and I, I really feel your heart when you say that, why isn't it working? And um, again, I, hear me well, let, let me say a few things here, but please do hear my heart and hear me well when I say this. Um, you know, I've been in ministry for, um, 
gosh, well over 30 years anyway, I've never say, said to one person, never said to one in any nation of the world, you don't have enough faith. I think everybody has enough faith. But what I say to 99.9% .9 of the people is you don't know how to use your faith. You're not applying your faith correctly. I think we all have faith. Faith is a gift of God. Yeah, we, we, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul said, the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So when you're a believer, you have faith. Faith comes by hearing the word. Okay, we all have faith. What I think often is people have, we have religious teaching, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, or people go astray in the application of your faith. So when somebody says, why isn't it working? Of course, without a direct revelation from God, I can't exactly answer and say this isn't working, but let me give you my very best guess because it's nearly always the same. Okay, let me see if this makes sense. What happens is whether or that's healing or we're believing for the salvation of somebody we know or you know, a situation to change, what happens to most of us is we, we get around the word of God, the message of faith, we hear something, we get excited, we believe God, we begin believing God. And then usually oh, after a few minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, whatever, usually a time comes where we begin to get discouraged. And we begin to look at our circumstances and say, oh, it isn't working. I'm still got pain. I, you know, these things are still happening to me. And um, usually the time comes where we, we begin saying within ourselves, this is no longer working. And I really want you to think this through again, without me mean in any way. But if somebody is, if you're saying to me, why isn't it working? What you're actually telling me is you believe it's not working. Let me say that again. If you're going to say to me, why isn't it working? I'm going to say to you, you you're, what you actually believe is it's not working. Because that, you see, what's happening here is people have a basic misunderstanding of what faith actually is. If I believe that it's worked, if I believe, let's just talk about salvation for a minute. I come to God as a sinner, I, just as I am without one plea. I call on his name and I believe that God saves me. Yeah? Now, I enter into salvation. If somebody prayed and said, God save me, and then 10 minutes later, somebody came to them and said, isn't that wonderful, you gave your life to Jesus, and they said, ah, oh, I don't believe it worked. Well, what would we do? Would we pray again and again and again? There has to come a time where they actually believe that they are saved. Not because of a goosebump, not because of a feeling, not because of a sensation, that they simply believe it based on the word of God. And, and again, what, what happens to all of us, we've all been through that many, many times. We begin believing, we begin that journey of faith. And then it's like we, the writer to the Hebrews says, cast not away your confidence, which is great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience. And patience is not this passive thing that simply says, I will sit there waiting for it to happen. What patience does, patience is endurance. Patience is I won't back down. Patience is I'm gonna hold on to God's word until it produces. Yeah, let me take a different tack on this as well. Jesus spoke in Mark 4 about a sower going to sow seed. And he spoke about four different grounds, okay? This is true for salvation, but this is exactly how we get healed. This is how we see breakthrough in our life. And Jesus said in the first category, the, the seed is sown, but immediately the birds of the earth come and steal the seed. What does that mean? There are people who can, you might hear this video right now and get really excited and faith begins to arise in your heart. And immediately, boom, Satan comes and says, that's never going to work for you. That guy's lying. That's not true. That won't work. That worked for him, but it won't work for you. And boom, immediately the seed's gone. There's a second category. Jesus spoke about those who receive the word and they, they they receive with meekness the engrafted word. They take God's word into the hearts and they begin to engage with it. But Jesus said, because they, the shallow, there's not much depth to the, the Christian walk, the Christian life, because the seed can't go down deep in terms of roots, it begins to spring up. And it, Jesus said, immediately the seed springs up. Great, it's beginning to work. And then he says, because they've got no depth of root in themselves, he says, when persecution, the word there is, is pressure. When pressure comes from the outside, 
they, they wither and die. They get offended, it says in Mark 4, and they wither and die. And that's probably where most of us are, where we, we hear the proclamation of God's word. We hear the gospel. We hear the message of faith. We say, hallelujah, I engage with that. God, I believe you. God, you are my healer. You are my savior. You are the God who will meet my needs. And we get excited about it for a few days. And then when the, the pain comes, when the situation is speaking to us louder than God is speaking to us, because we don't have that depth in us that will keep us steady, it's like we have a, a little flourishing of faith and then boom, it withers and dies. And then Jesus spoke about a third category. Those who receive the word with gladness, they begin to bear fruit. But then he says the curse of the world, the deceitfulness of riches or the desire of other things. And that is a, it's a different category in a way where sometimes we will receive God's word and then we get distracted. Bright, shiny object syndrome, I call it. We get pulled away. We get distracted into thinking about other things. And it's like we let go and we're no longer, and it's like we get conned out of the word because of our desire to earn money, the, the fear that we, we, get, we begin watching the news more than we read our Bible, the curse of the world, and, and suddenly the word's gone out of us. And then Jesus said there's a, a fourth category of people who receive the word and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. And then in the next few verses, Jesus actually teaches us how to become a 30 fold Christian, a 60 fold Christian or a hundred fold Christian. And he says, the, with the measure you receive God's word, that is the measure it will produce in your life. It says in the Amplified Bible, the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the, the measure of power and virtue that flows back into your life. So let me wind this down, but to, again, to encourage anybody who's thinks I prayed and it's not working. What's really happening there is you've allowed Satan, let's not play the blame game, but the seed is no longer in your heart. Put the seed of God's word back in there and don't let it be pulled and it will work. Selah. Good, second question we had today was about communion, which is a uh, good question actually. For some reason, you know, there are things that pop up in the body of Christ, ideas, arguments, issues people work through. And for whatever reason, I've noticed in the last few weeks, lots of people are talking about communion. I think some of this came from, uh, I know Francis Chan made some comments about it. And um, what is the right or wrong way of taking communion? Uh, sh the question was, should it be the centerpiece of what the church does when it gathers? Um, again, I, I would actually say no. I think it should be an important thing but I don't think it is a, um, come on, here is the danger. Can I say this? The church, if you look back in Job church history, one of the reasons when I, every time I do teaching, ministry, training, mentoring, is I always put a course on church history because it's really important that we look at church history. It's important both as believers in the 21st century that we don't discount church history. We don't disconnect from church history. But it's also important that we're actually really honest about what went on in church history. And what sometimes happens is people... Um, you know, we can worship the modern. We can get the idea that anything that happened, anything more than five years ago wasn't cool. You know, I know some people who won't read a book that wasn't written in the last 10 years or any, any worship song that's older than five years old is just, oh, that's like passe and old and old hat. And so there can be a worship of the modern, which is stupid and foolish and we miss things, but there can also be a worship of that which is old. And the point is not whether something's new or old. The point is whether something's true. And um, I think what a lot of this debate around communion, uh, what often happens is that people are, will look at churches, for instance, the, like the Roman Catholic Church, some parts of the Orthodox churches, the Anglican communion, where there's very much a, like a Eucharistic sense. There's very much that thing where the, the focal point of their worship is the taking of the bread and the wine. And, you know, you literally talk about the host and this is God manifest. And in a way, they'll say that the high point of worship is us taking the bread and the wine. And uh, again, I, I, I know I'm making a vast generalization here, but I still believe this is true. By and large, I would say the churches 
that do that, there's not an awful lot of anything else going on. My point is, if you, you went to, uh, there are many, many Catholic Anglican churches, not all, but, but many were, they're making a big fuss, if you will, of the, the bread and the wine. But my point is, in worship, there's very little going on. There's not that sense of God's presence. There's not real people crying, laughing, worshiping the King of Kings. There's people, you know, in a bored manner going through songs, or there's a sermon that is not preaching the word of life, the word of faith, nourishing. You know, quite often those churches will be very happy to have somebody as a minister who's not even born again. So there are many, again, I want to be clear, there are many Roman Catholic priests who are true believers in Jesus, but there are many who are not true believers in Jesus. And the structure is basically okay with that. That's true of the, the Anglican Church. I'm from England, in the Church of England. There are some of the best Christians in the world there. And there are some people leading churches there who are clearly not believers in Jesus Christ. They've had bishops who don't believe in the resurrection, um, you know, in the UK, things like that. So. My point is, when, when we begin to lose the real sense of what's in the spirit, we tend to compensate in the flesh. So I, I think communion is a, a glorious, vital thing. I think it's a place where we encounter God, one of them. I, I think it's great if people take that every day or every week when they gather, absolutely. But I think Jesus gave us something that anybody in any place in the world, whether they're eating a rice cake in China or, you know, a piece of black Russian bread or something in South America, whatever, I think he gave us something really simple that we can do. And my point is, listen to me really carefully. The truth is in the spirit, not in the flesh. Okay. So whenever we miss what's in the spirit, we'll tend to create a ceremony, get a little silver cup go through all kinds of things and begin to impute into the physical what we haven't grasped in the spirit. So I think what we should be doing with communion is saying, Lord, what's actually really going on here? Because the point, the point is what God wants with you and I is not a little ceremony where we, um, we, we take a bread and wine and have a goosebump or something. He wants to walk in communion, common union with him. Or the, he wants you to abide in him. He wants you to go through Walmart and Asda with him. He wants you to walk in the spirit and be Emmanuel, God with us, having that abiding relationship all the time. And when we take that communion, we are celebrating his passion, his death, his life, his resurrection, his ascension, and our place in him. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. But a lot of the ceremonies and traditions and things we've added to that, I think are, at best are useless and at worst are actually really destructive. So I, I think my point is I, I want Jesus to be the center of our gathering. I want his person, his presence, not simply one of the things we do. So we do things like communion or we do things like baptism, but I don't worship baptism. I worship the risen Christ. That, that's something we do and we obey, we go through, but it's not the, I think the focal point of, um, of a gathering of believers in a way should be the risen Jesus, should be his presence, should be his word, should be his spirit, should be his people. And that that's something really important that we do and we unite around, but I don't believe that's the focal point. And again, I would warn people against putting too much in that in the natural. Christians can be so superstitious. You know, I'm a I'm somebody who loves Israel. I believe in Israel. I believe uh, all of God's covenant promises to Israel are still real. Don't believe in replacement theology or that. And yet, I know I've seen a lot of Christians who go there, and it's like they. What they're really doing is going to Disneyland or Venice, yeah? And they come back with their prayer shawls and want to say Yeshua instead of Jesus. And my point is they, they buy into like a kind of paraphernalia, the, the, an, an outward appearance of what they think Israel is rather than grasping what God is trying to do in the spirit. Because God's plan for Israel is that all of Israel becomes a follower of Messiah Jesus. And my point is, we don't need to have a sort of fake love for Israel. We need to have the real love of Israel. And the, the best way you can do that is to pray that they would come to faith in Messiah. That's what Paul did. 
Yeah, when you read about it in the book of Romans. So absolutely take communion, love communion, enjoy communion. But the goal, my, my real point is this, the goal of communion isn't lace, cups, silver, special wines, special things. And the goal of communion isn't even bread and wine. The goal of communion is communion with God. Yeah, the goal of communion is you and I being in communion with God. And that's like a focal point, but it's not the, it's the doorway, not the goal. Boom. Good. Let me carry on here. Uh, somebody asked the question, should we, is it right to be part of an organized church, um, a structured organized church? <laughs> Again, that's one of those things. Uh, I've seen this one around social media a little bit this week. Can I say, I, I want to say this with love and respect to anybody who posts these kind of things, but don't post them. Listen, here's the bottom line. There's no such a thing as the unorganized church. I, I saw a, a, a social media post this week where somebody was talking about the man-made church. What is a man-made church? <laughs> now, again, everybody says, I want to be in a God-made church and a God-led church and a spirit-led church. Amen. Me too. <laughs> but my point is, in one sense, every church is a man-made church or maybe a woman-made church when it's initiated or led by a man or a woman. And any time we ever say, well, I don't want an organized church, I mean, what happens? We leave the organized church and we decide, hey, we'll gather in Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or whatever. And um, within two or three weeks, people want to come to your gathering and you say, they say, hey, where are we gathering? And you say, we're led by the spirit. We're not organized. And they say, hallelujah, that's the kind of place I want to come to. And they say, what time do you guys meet? And you say, we're not organized. And they say, yeah, I, I want an unorganized church. How do I hook up with you guys? When, how can I bring somebody to the gathering? And you say, well, we don't know. We're just not organized. <laughs> Doesn't work. So quickly, somebody says, hey, we'll meet in Starbucks at 7 p.m. Great, where will you be? We'll sit in the corner. And my point is quickly, you begin organizing things. And then what do you do when you get there? Well, is it possible to gather in Starbucks and every single week you change every single thing you do? Yeah, it is. But quite quickly, um, you're going to gather and if you love Jesus, you're going to want to praise him and worship him. You're going to want people to share within your community. Um, you're going to want somebody sharing the word. You're going to offer to pray one for another you're going to uh, give people a chance to give to the worker, all the, the normal things that the organized church does. So my point is whenever somebody says, should we belong to part of the organized church? There is no other kind of church. <laughs> there really isn't. Now there's a, you, you, what, what a better question might be is to what degree should that be organized? Or is there room and structure within the organization for God to move? for us to change the structure of that. The, the lesson of the wineskin is the old wineskin tells the wine what to do. The old wineskin is rigid. The new wineskin flows and expands and retracts and allows the wine to shape the form of the skin rather than the skin shaping the form of the wine. But if you have no wine skin, all you do is have wine all over your carpet and you can dance on your carpet saying, we're free, we're unorganized, we're free. But, you know, frankly, that's just foolishness. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what the apostles did, what the apostles taught. So the issue is not having, um, you know, if you look at it, God gave Israel a very, a set of organized things to do, ceremonies, structures, holidays, whatever. And the real point was those were places to meet with God. Yeah. And now people could go and meet with God there or some simply went and, you know, engage with the form, the structure, the religious thing, if you will, and didn't find real relationship with God. But they could have. And it's the same today in any gathering. So if somebody says, hey, we don't need it. I love it when people say we don't need a church building. Yeah, that, that, I agree. Amen. Meet in a home. But quite quickly that home becomes... You know, I, I used to have a church that met in, my home, met in my home for years, but it is, my point is you, you've then got to work through what time do we start, who cleans the carpets, uh, who brings the coffee, all of those. You, it really is an organized church. So the answer is not to say organized versus unorganized. The answer is to say, let's be led by the spirit in the way in which we organize things. Boom. Good, question number four today. Uh, this is one many people keep asking, do we have to tithe? Um, 
Right, let me try and flow through this really quickly. Uh, number one, no, you do not. You do not have to. Again, let me unpick the question. The problem is what we're really saying is what do we mean by have to? And you know, the danger is we, we, we ask salvation questions about non-salvation issues. So to spend eternity with God, to be part of the family of God, to be forgiven by God, do you have to tithe? No, of course not. It's all by grace. It's all by the finished works of Jesus. Um, a better question might be, should we tithe? Now, personally, uh, as a choice, I would say, yes, my advice would be to tithe. Um, but I don't think it's an obligation. I think God loves you. I actually like to say, sometimes I'm teasing when I do this, tithing is for mature believers. So if somebody, I like to say, if you're a baby Christian, you're figuring this out, yeah, do whatever you want. But uh, I think tithing is a great principle. I think it's a godly principle. And again, to just to shoot some of those sacred cows, tithing is not part of the law. Tithing was the before the law. It was a during the law. Jesus said we should, said we should tithe. Um, the writer to the Hebrews says we should tithe in the New Covenant. Many people haven't read that. And people should read their Bibles. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 7 says, under the Old Covenant, we brought our tithe and we presented it to a priest. But the writer to the Hebrews says, we now, New Covenant, blood wash, we bring our tithe and present it to Jesus. So I, I believe in a way we should tithe, but I don't think that's a law. It's not a, if you were to say to me, should we worship? I would say, yes, we should worship. If you would say, should we serve in a local church? I would say, yes, we should. If you would say, should we um, share our faith? Yes, we should. But they're not salvation issues, they're maturity issues, they're flourishing issues. So again, tithing was the before the law, Abraham tithed, Jacob tithed. Um, you know, that's a, that tithing was birthed out of a people of faith and a people of promise, not out of the law. Um, and then I think tithing's thereafter. So I would usually reverse this to people though. And you know, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, you know, they're all bent up out of shape about this tithing thing. Uh, you know, having done this for many years, what I usually know is there's something going on in their heart that has nothing to do with tithing. You know, quite often people, I've very rarely met people who get angry and don't want preaching against tithing who give more than 10%. You know, if you look in a church, um, usually the people who are like about tithing and we're under grace and the law, they're the people who are giving like 1% or less. You know, they'll throw in the odd 20 kind of thing and who are not um, substantively giving to God. Not always, but usually they're. So what I would say to anybody is absolutely read the scriptures, give, Paul puts it this way, give as you purpose in your heart before God. And... I think there's a place for most of us in countries like America or Western Europe to give a lot more than tithing, but that's an individual thing between you and God. And I think we should take the pressure, the obligation. You know, if I, if I give an offering, but I really have no choice, I'm obliged to do it. It's no longer a free will offering. If I go to church and somebody holds a gun against my head, and says, you better lift your hands and worship. Well, I've, it's no longer an offering of my heart. I'm obliged to do it. And in a way, if somebody holds a theological gun against your head and says, you must tithe, you know, I would actually not tithe just to be not put under the law. I want to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made me free. And yet I think there's a really good principle there. I think the principle is on giving God the first portion. I think there's actually a principle of, of tenths that you'll see all the way through the Bible, again, before the law, during the law and after the law, where the tenth represents the part. You know, when they came into Israel, there were 10 cities, the Decapolis, Deca, 10, decimal, same word. And God said to them, these 10 cities I'm giving to you, but I want you to give me the first one, Jericho. And they couldn't touch anything that was in Jericho. The principle of first um, you'll see it in the, the offerings of animal, donkeys or whatever. God said, the firstborn is mine. Do you remember the, um, the firstborn son was required in Egypt? Um, there's a principle of giving God not just 10%, but the first 10% of declaring you are more important than my mortgage company, than AT&T, than whatever, and I honor you and put you first. And I 
I approve this in my life, like Malachi says, that the windows of heaven are open above my life, that he pours out on me blessing I can't even receive. Now, if you want to argue about that, oh, go argue about it. Do whatever works for you. But I would suggest if you're actually battling saying, if in a way the motivation of our heart is really how little can we give to God, that says something about, not about our money, but about our heart, about our relationship with God, which is not good. So do we have to tithe? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but I think it's a good thing to do. And my last question today was, it's a really good one as well. Can we always pray for the healing of others? Um, I think the obvious answer is yes, we can always pray for that. But um, I think in a way implicit in the question is the idea that we can, it's one proposition where we believe God for ourselves. There's another when we're praying for somebody else whose will, whose desire to get near to God um, is involved in that equation. And um, yeah, again, let me give you a real quick answer then try and unpack that for a few moments. Again, I would say that if we, I think we can come to God with confidence and faith and say, Lord, I believe that you are my healer and I'm gonna stand and I expect to see that manifestation in my life. Um, I think whenever, I basically agree that's true, whenever we're praying for other people, there are other things involved and it gets a lot more complicated and at times we're gonna find ourselves in situations praying for other people who don't believe in God, people who are in rebellion against God, people who don't want God in their life. Um, at times you're gonna find yourself, I've done this, I've prayed for people who don't want to be healed, who are actually, um, you know, it's kind of painful to me in a way, but uh, you know, I was in a situation where, where a member of my family was very ill and I went to them saying, hey, let's, let's get serious about, let's get you healed. And in a way, this person said, you know, I've already, I, I've already gone to heaven in my heart. I've already checked out in a way and just let's, let's just leave this alone. Like I know God's the healer, but, um, and you can't, you can't override somebody else's will. So again, again, a few qualifications on that. I think there's a different equation when we're talking about children. And by that, I mean younger children, children who are not really adults who are under our care, under our supervision. I think in a way they come under the umbrella of our faith and um, you know we can pray for them in a way that's very different than even praying for adult children or children who are standing on their own two feet you know in a sense there's a way for younger children where they younger children come under the it's like they can live under the umbrella of their parents faith and the parents relationship with god younger children can experience god without actually yet being born again themselves and knowing him because they haven't yet reached that time where they can be born again where they can make a, a serious engagement with God, but they can enjoy him. You know, the peace of God, the shalom of God goes beyond our understanding, Philippians 4 says. So you can ha experience the peace even if you don't have the understanding. But uh, again, in terms of healing, I would put it this way. I think it's like a sliding scale in a way. I think there's a place where we can always believe for ourselves. I think we can help people who really want to be helped, but there's a place where they, for, to a greater or lesser degree where we need to see engagement from them. Let me, let me give you one key which will really help you here as well. Whenever I'm praying for other people, I never question is it God's will to heal them or is it not God's will to heal them because the Bible tells me it's God's will to heal them. But what I will often do is come to the Lord individually and say, Lord, tell me what I should do. Give me a word. If you're telling me I can stand in faith, then I will stand on what you're telling me. And I will believe you for the healing of that person. And I can believe you with faith and confidence because it's something you've said to me. Or at times I'll come to him and it's like the Lord says, yeah, I want to do it, but it's not gonna happen. And, you know, just, I don't mean leave them in the situation, but just pray, find out what you can believe for. And, um, so in every situation like that, I want to come and get a word of God for me, for that individual, because that way I know it's something I can stand on. I know it's something I can appropriate. And I've been in that situation, um, many times actually, but several I can think of where people have been very near death. You know, doctors said they're probably going to die today or whatever. And I've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, what, 
I know your will, but what does your wisdom say? Should I, is this a fight we're gonna win? Do you want me to fight that fight or do you want me to simply say, I commit them into your hands? And I've had times where God said, no, stand. And, and I've seen miraculous healing and somebody who should have died that one day, live another 20 years or whatever. So I think coming to God and saying, Lord, really give me a word that I can believe for is a powerful thing. Um, my last thought there as well, and I'm going to be starting an online group that, that helps with this, is rather than praying for people, you know, one of the things I don't like to do that I see Christians do a lot, it's kind of social media thing, is, you know, somebody will say, I'm ill, and all the people write praying, 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 and what does that mean? It doesn't usually mean an awful lot if we're really honest, and I think we'd be better um, finding a context where we can commit. I'll tell you what's much harder than writing the word praying and pressing the return key is, is saying, I will commit to walk with you through this. I will walk the floor every day and declare your healing. I'll stand with you. When your hand slips because you're weary, I'll be a Joshua and hold your hand up. I will help you fight the good fight of faith. I won't back down until you've seen breakthrough. Now, again, that's, that's a lot more... It's, uh, that requires a lot more than simply, yeah, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. And um, yeah, that's an important thing to do. And we have an online support group we'll be starting next week to help people do that. So if you're interested in finding more, uh, visit my website, gjm.org for details there. Good, well, there's five questions for a Friday afternoon. Uh, again, do check out some of the links below. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you're watching there and YouTube will let you know about future videos. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, we're in the midst of going through the book of Ephesians, which is a really great book. I know that would bless you. And I have a lot of other video resources and our online ministry school. Great. Bye for now.